with Pastor Kael that has things to show you that if you know what they are, you will appreciate them. Some of these things are priceless, priceless artifacts that he's brought from the Great Awakening. But if you don't know what they are, the burglars of the world will pass them by. But I want to do that. I want to bring your attention to a couple of things that was brought up uh, about this. When God showed up in the kingdom of Hawaii, everything that you wanted to see changed did get changed and changed for the better. Education, civility, the government, uh, everything. And then there is the supernatural aspect of God, which I heard a lot of references to by Chris Cook, and that is God's creativity. Sign language. Who knew that Hawaii had anything to do with this international sign language? But this is evidence that God would use a tiny, tiny kingdom out in the middle of the ocean to influence the whole world. This is God. Everybody who sees the work of God in the islands knows this is the Lord. That's exactly what he wants to do again today in our place. I want to also give thanks to the missionaries, which we haven't talked about, but one of the first things that they did in their education is they emphasized to these literate Hawaiians to record Hawaiian history, Hawaiian culture. So men like David Malo, Samuel Kamakawa, they were given the direction Honolulu Seminary to go back to the chiefs and record history. This is exactly the opposite of what the world thinks that the missionaries came. The missionaries came to supplant the culture. Absolutely not. They were always interested in making their culture and their background known to the world and to preserve it. Because without a written language, that was not easy to do. But thanks to the missionaries and work of men. Uh, such as I mentioned, and the other missionaries, they were afforded to kept them alive. So I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Paeo. Give him a warm welcome. We are very grateful on short notice that he came to be a part of
and I was willing to put everything aside, culture, family, whatever it is, to pursue the thing that I needed, and that was the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Two very powerful days in my life when I made that decision to follow Christ at all costs, even if it cost me my, my reputation or my, my association with my culture. Very powerful day for me, the most important day, because that's when I received my salvation. Second most important day of my spiritual life was the day that I realized all of those myths were not true. And my years spent hating the church and missionaries, uh, and by default, Christ himself, were years wasted because the simple truth was that Native Hawaiians were responsible for the push uh, of the arrival of the gospel. A fact that changed my life. Books like The Providential Life of Henry Okaia and, and the story of Okaia really transformed me as a, as a young person. Uh, and so it was a, a very beautiful day when Jesus gave back to me my culture of being Hawaiian. And now I can stand before you and I have no conflict in my heart and in my soul uh, between being Hawaiian and loving Jesus Christ. Amen. And a lot of you that are from here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That chip that is on many of our shoulders. It is hard for me to acknowledge Christ because Hawaiians aren't supposed to do that. That was a lie from the pit of hell and it continues to be one of the most devastating lies that is perpetuated in, in Hawaii now. Uh, the truth of the story is that Hawaiians were very much in love with Jesus, and there was nothing more natural than for them to do so. And so the mission of our organization, and I'm sure at the heart of Pastor Rob and Pastor Barbara and, and, and Chris is, is for that truth to be told that God is good, Jesus is good. And along the way we find some interesting things out. That missionaries, one thing that I can never discredit about the missionaries, as much as I wanted to, you know, um, these people came from good lives in New England. They were set up, a lot of them had money, education, middle class, upper middle class, upper class really. Uh, they left all those comforts. They left their own culture, they left their own families. Uh, many of them got sick, many of them died. They risked it all really to fulfill the Great Commission, to go to the other side of the world and take the thing that they deemed most important, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that fact, I can never take away from the American missionaries. Uh, having said that, they did make some mistakes when they got there. <laughs> and any of you that have been on a mission have probably made some mistakes as well. And, and that's part of the story too. And we as, as the church now, we have to focus on telling the real story. Um, the missionaries weren't perfect, but Jesus was. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of a little bit of a background on why uh, we do the things that we do. I want to highlight a few um, artifacts that um, we just heard about in, in Chris's presentation. Um, most notably, and this would be the one that really started my uh, journey into collecting crazy old things, um, this is the first edition of the Memoirs of Henry Okaia. Wow. Back then called the uh, Memoirs of Okaia. Yeah. And this is from 1819. This is the little book that was published and printed and sent around New England. Became one of the most uh, one of the most printed and best selling books in all of the uh, colonies in New England at that time. And really, the momentum gained through the memoirs of Okaia is what led to the push uh, for the mission to come to Hawaii. In fact, Elijah Loomis, one of the missionaries. Uh, acknowledges that he only decided to join the mission to Hawaii after having read the memoirs of Henry of Okaia. So most notably in our um, artifact collection, yeah, this is this is the a real deal right here. <laughs> this is the memoirs of Henry of Okaia. Later, if you guys want, um, you're welcome to come up and, and take a look at them. Um, since we're talking about the memoirs of Okaia, um, Chris mentioned that when the missionaries arrived, they knew they had to tell a story about them, why they were there. Um, simply saying, we're, we're here to preach the gospel. Okay, cool, but why? How do you know about us? What's the deal? What are you guys doing here? And how can we get connected with you? <laughs> and so, uh, along with the gospel message, they also have to tell the story of Okaia. He mentioned that they uh, printed the Olelo Hawaii version of the memoirs, which was in 1867. 
printed on that world famous Lahaina Luna printing press by Elijah Loomis. And this is the first edition uh, copy of the Bolelo uh, and Memoirs of Henry Mokukar. It's pretty rare, but uh, Auntie Debbie Lee has one of these in her purse. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was all excited. She's the, the woman responsible for bringing Mokukar uh, Eva, his EV back from New England to Haikolu. And so I thought it was cool when they said, Oh, Auntie, you know what? We got one of the. Oh, she goes, Oh, like this. Who <laughs> <laughs> said, I'm going to stop. Auntie, you got to keep that seat. So, so these are the two uh, different versions, both first edition copies of the memoirs of Henry Mokukahania. Uh, and you can look at that later, too. Let's see. Oh. So we talked about Lynchfield County, and we talked about uh, the community there. We also talked about the foreign mission school. Uh, I know you guys learned a lot about Sam and John Mills Jr. And, and the ABCFM, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. And another organization that basically became the ABCFM is called the Foreign Mission Society. Um, this is um, from 1815, okay? So this is, Henry's alive, and the boys are all there. This is from 1815. This is a sermon preached at Lynchburg before the Foreign Mission Society, and it's at this meeting that Hopu first starts to express interest in also returning to Hawaii as a missionary alongside of Hopu Kahia. And uh, Hopu had a wild life. While Henry was uh, busy matriculating with the Yale students, Hopu was living out adventures that many of us can't even imagine. And we are fortunate that nowadays we have access to uh, not only Henry's memoirs, but also the memoirs of Thomas Hopu. Um, that I mentioned you. If you have Kindle Unlimited, I'm not trying to sell you guys on anything. If you have Kindle, it's free on Amazon. So pick it up, Memoirs of Thomas Hopu. It's in his own original handwriting, and he tells some amazing stories. Um, from the boys leaving uh, Keala Kekua to him being tossed overboard, uh, which Henry does mention in his memoir as well. Uh, but Hopu's depiction of the story is absolutely wild. And he is. I'll just give you a little bit of it. He's floating in the water as the ship sails beyond the horizon. And he assumes he's basically hopeless. And he is not a Christian at the time. Uh, but as he floats, he, he says he sees a bird. And he said, I assumed it was a bird of a pua. And so I called out to this bird. And I said, uh, go back to your master. And tell him that if he gets me out of this, I'll give him my fine coat that the captain gave to me. And then, you know, it's this, it's this internal dialogue between, uh, you know, Hoku and himself. And it's just an amazing story. Of course, he's then rescued and pulled back on the, on the ship. And a giant shark comes up alongside him. And then you can see the transition because he immediately says, I know, now I know which God it was. It was Jehovah. That same, you know, and it's just an amazing story. He also fought in the War of 1812, along and, alongside Stonewall Jackson. He was, a, he was a, a military man, and in one incident, he was taken captive during the war four different times and escaped four different times. While he while he was in prison one time, um, he was starving to death, and the African American slaves were the ones that fed him. And from that moment on, he expresses a deep hatred. For, for, for African slavery in America. And if you know the ABCFM, if you know Samuel John Mills Jr., um, it, that very much becomes uh, a central uh, core value of this, this push against um, slavery. Um, after he's fighting in a safe prison, he actually is shipwrecked with his uh, entire crew and the captain 400 miles off the coast. It just capsizes. Well, Hopu gets the rope, rescues all of his. Um, crew members, dives back down under the ship and retrieves the materials from the cabin, the captain's cabin, all the materials necessary to come back and build a sail that they say he navigated by star to bring the crew all the way back 400 miles to the coast. That's what I am. Nothing more Hawaiian than that. You know, and uh, the story is just amazing. And like I said, we don't have time to share the whole memoirs with you, but if you want to read it for yourself, it's readily available. On Amazon, so please check it out. It what it has been dormant for 200 years. That's the amazing thing. Um, there was a we actually went to uh, 
um, the archives in New England that had that have the original copy of it. And when we talked to the curator of the museum, they said, "You guys are the second human beings that have ever come in to look at this file that has the whole memoirs in it. The first was a guy named John F. Mulholland, who was the uh, the chaplain of Kapalama Command Schools in 1958. For whatever reason, he had gone up there." He had also gazed upon it, and he typed it up and entered it into the Kamehameha and UH database, and that was really the only phantom reference we, we, we have of it. Well, because God is good and we live in this technological age, we were able to track it down and go and have it digitized by the people at Yale, and now it's published for you to read in Hoku's own handwriting, which is absolutely amazing. So that's just a little bit of a, a side note on, on the memoirs of Kenya. Yes. Memoirs of Thomas Hope, and it's spelled H O P O O because that's how he spelled his name. Remember, there was no Hawaiian alphabet at the time, so they're they're basically pioneering all of that. So it's not Hope, it's it's Hope, but it's spelled that way. And on the cover of the book, the um, font that is used is his handwriting. So when it says Memoirs of Hope. Um, and that, uh, this artifact right here is where he first decides that he will indeed become a member of the mission and he's going to go with Henry and take the gospel back to the Hawaiian people. Uh, a goal that he was able to accomplish. Uh, this here is the sermon that was delivered at Goshen, Connecticut at the ordination of Reverend Hiram Bingham and Lisa Thurston. This is September 29, 1819. So this is basically the commissioning of the, of the missionaries to come to Hawaii. And for us Hawaiians, this is the smoking gun. Because clearly listed on the back of the first missionary voyage from America to the Kingdom of Hawaii, listed native teachers, John Hawaii, Thomas Hoku, William Hawaii. And spelled, you know, Thomas Honorini. Uh, John Tomorini, Thomas Hoku, and William Tenui, alongside George Tomorini, which is uh, Ume Ume Kaumori, Kaumori's son, who had been lost abroad in America that was also brought into the uh, foreign missions movement and then returned as a passenger on uh, the voyage, but not as a teacher or a missionary. And if you know the stories of Ume Ume, he becomes a, a staunch anti missionary. Not a fan of the mission movement. And, um, upon the death of uh, Kamalii, Kamalii is already dead. Kamalii has married Kamalii, and now Kamalii is dead. Kamalii takes his leave and marries him in a Christian funeral um, off of his island at Waimea, an insult that was in the eyes of Hume Hume unforgivable. And so he decides to make war on what he calls the Winter Kingdom. Rallies his support of which he did have on Kauai. He's the son of Kauai. Uh, he rallies support to make an advance on Lilo Lilo in Honolulu, uh, a rebellion that's cut off by Kauai Moku, who gets word of, of the mutiny and stops them from uh, attacking Honolulu. Uh, at the same time that this is happening, Kauai is in Waiuku leading a prayer vigil for that very, he's praying that nothing happens and people don't get killed and so um, Kalani Moku stops Umehune from attacking Honolulu um, and after they chase him through uh, the hills of Kauai when they find him he's sitting on a stump and his request is that he be his funeral be in the old ways kill him and you know strip the flesh take the bones tie him he wants to be done in the old Hawaiian style and rather than grant that request, uh, Alani Moku removes his own feather coat, his, his mark of loyalty. He removes his own cloak and he drapes it over the shoulders of Ume Ume and he says, it. Amazing. And that's the influence of Christianity and, and the fruits of revival in the islands. Kalani Moku was a savage warrior. Kamehameha's boy would kill any of us at the drop of a hat. Transformed uh, by the influence of Christ. Um, the 
but this is the document that proves this this one this one cut me deep, you know. And this is the one that proves that the first missionaries to Hawaii uh, were Native Hawaiians. Yes, they they're called teachers here, but we need to think about the story from a rational perspective. As a kid, what I thought was this batch of howlings came from the mainland out of their own ambition. They anchored up, they forced their way in, and they were successful in their mission to steal our culture and implement Christianity. But that doesn't make any sense. Because see, I went on a mission to Argentina one time, and I didn't speak Spanish. And you know how much evangelism I was capable of? Zero. I had no knowledge of their culture. I'll never do another mission like that. Because I was useless. The mission was for me, but not for them. And when I came home from that, I thought about the missionaries. And I said, wow, how can a batch of white guys from a meeting who don't speak the language, who don't know the culture, who don't know who's in charge, and if they did, they wouldn't be able to get an audience anyway. They weren't armed. They weren't soldiers. How could they have? The truth is that, that they didn't. Who do you think spoke to Eva Eva? Who do you think spoke to, to Kaamanu? It was Hofu, it was Honolulu, it was Kanuni. That's the only way it could have happened. The Americans didn't speak on the way. It did, and when you think about it rationally, it makes a lot more sense. But for Kanaka, that was eye-opening to say the least for me. Wait a second, that does make sense. Wait, we did do this. Yeah? And the, all the proof that we really need is uh, clearly documented in this uh, pamphlet right here. We can, here, we can pass this one around. Okay. Yeah, sure, if you're going to be right. This, this EK doesn't belong to me. This is, this is, all of this is just um, a vehicle for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is not a, a promotion of Hawaiian history or culture. This is a promotion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we're talking about in these presentations is how do we get back to revival, right, Pastor Rob? Right. And a place where when you used to walk down the streets in Hilo, you couldn't find somebody who wasn't a Christian. And not just wah type Christian, like living type Christian. Born again, baptized, literate, Bible believing Christians. That was everywhere you went. How do we get back there? What was happening when those things were taking place? Well, God was doing His thing, one. But people were loving Christ, and people were loving their neighbors, and people were trying to live according to the scriptural mandates, and making mistakes, and repenting, and, you know? And, and, and these are all products of, of that revival, the amazing thing that God was doing at that time. Um, so this is rebound, because it was really bust up on the inside. Um, but this is uh, a first edition printing of the memoirs of Samuel John Mills Jr. So this is, a, he has a memoir too, yeah. And on the inside, I shouldn't touch it, but I will. Um, you can see that this is the original uh, memoir. And in this, in this book, he talks about his ambitions to take the gospel to Hawaii alongside Henry uh, You know what Samuel John Mills used to do? He used to buy land in the meantime, or buy uh, land in Africa. And he would sail back to America and he would raise money and he would buy slaves. And he would sail them back to Africa and let them go on the land that he had purchased. So to the white world, they were his slaves on his land, but to them, they were free. Wow. That's a little bit of a glimpse into the character of the man that would be the Hanai brother of Henry Hopu Hawaii. Really best, you know. Other than Hopu, um, Mills is, is Henry's best friend. Um, did, did you mention, uh, I heard a little bit about the hymns. They, they sang hymns on when the, when the um, missionaries would leave. And one of the hymns that was specific to the mission to Hawaii was called Wake Isles of the South. And um, you'll hear mention of it in several of the, the missionary narratives. So we sang Wake Isles of the South and, you know, to open the ceremony or whatever it was. So that um, got me curious about it. And you're able to find it online. They have, you know, it's a famous hymn. You, you can read the music and sing it. But we are actually able to track down the original. So this is the, this is not a reprint. This is Wake Isles of the South, that the handwritten original is written in a quilt and everything. So this was created for 
uh, Henry and the Missions of Hawaii. Anybody read the music? <laughs> well, another, I don't, I don't know if you're there yet, but one huge misconception I had as a young What is the name of that song again? We Isles of the Sun. Yeah. Um, one thing that was news to me when I first started studying all this is that the missionaries did not come with the intention to steal the kingdom and all the land and all the money. That really was new news for me, because that's that's what I grew up with. Yeah. Um, this document here is called, it's a special report of the Prudential Committee on the control to be exercised over missionaries and mission churches. And, and basically laid out in, in documents like this are, are the bylaws for the members of the ABCFM mission in Hawaii. Listen, they weren't even allowed, they weren't even allowed to buy property, they weren't even allowed to work jobs that would get them paid. It was a communal stock program, so all the money came from Boston, and when it got here, they would divvy it up amongst the mission stations, and they had to live off of that. And if they did it, if they strayed from that, they were kicked off the mission. The original doctor, the first doctor on the, on the mission, did just that, and was kicked off of the mission, sent back to America, and then died there, not shortly thereafter. So my um, belief that the missionaries came in order to acquire land, and to make money, and to steal, it was actually strictly forbidden by their own organization. And the people that did that were not missionaries. Let's all acknowledge that that did happen at some point. They were not missionaries. And I know we're leaping way forward here, and I don't know when Pastor Wayne wants me to stop, but another huge misconception for me um, was that, or that the missionaries overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy. Well, that's not true. Uh, it was their children and grandchildren, the descendants of missionaries, that participated in that. Um, some of them weren't even born, uh, you know. So uh, that was news to me. I thought that the missionaries did that. The reason I thought that is because what happened is during the provisional government and the overthrow, they created a political party that they dubbed the Missionary Party. They weren't missionaries. Mission work had stopped for decades in the, in the Christian nation by the you don't send missionaries where there's no non-believers. That's a waste, that's a fundraising thing. So they they were Christians already. Um, anyway, I'm jumping all over all, all, all the things. But, but the problem was that um, when you call yourself the missionary party and then you overthrow the monarchy, from then on people are gonna say that the missionaries did that, and that's exactly what I believe. But there was no active missionaries in Hawaii when the monarchy was overthrown. They had a sneaky, clever way of doing that by calling themselves the missionary party. But really, it, it poisoned the water for future generations of Mormons like me, who grew a strong distaste for the word missionary because of the church's uh, involvement in the overthrow of the world. So, anyway, that's like 100 years later. Uh, uh, here's something. Now, these are not from the time, they're not original, they're not that old, but these were made from an artist on the Big Island. And when we contacted her, we were asking if we could somehow get replicas of the type of weapons that would have been used um, in the battles where Okokami's village was taken. Um, so she created these, these are materials from that area uh, and made in the fashion that they, they would have been. So these are just cool visuals about um, this is likely some of the weapons that were carried when Mokukagi's um, family were murdered and really sent him out on his way. So those are just Shakti and Kowalwood and Coconut House. Uh, I have a ton more artifacts up here. You guys, have you guys heard about Kua Aiki? I'll be talking about Kua Aiki later. But he's one of the early converts to Christianity, uh, Hawaiian converts to Christianity. His Hawaiian name was Kua Aiki. Uh, the missionaries called him Bartimaeus, the blind Bartimaeus, because he lost his sight. Um, he was such an amazing character that both the missionary Hiram Bingham and Jonathan Smith Green decided to write um, biographies about him. And these 
part of the two um, first editions of the memoir, uh, the, the, the biography of Kuahiki. This one's called The Life of Bartimaeus. This one is by Jonathan Smith Green. And, and this one is by Hiram Bingham. It's called The Bartimaeus of the Savage Islands. Um, Hiram Bingham was the, the co leader of the first missionary voyage to Hawaii from the ABC. And Jonathan Smith Green, uh, a lot of you know the Bailey House, right? It's actually the greenhouse. Uh, the Bailey House was built by Jonathan Smith Green, who then moved up to Makua to plant what we now call Makua Union and Kokela Church. I was on staff at Kokela for about 10 years. Um, he founded those churches, and the Baileys moved in to Wailuku, and it became the Bailey House. But uh, Jonathan Smith Green chose to write the biography about Kuahiki. Uh, and one notable thing about Kuahiki is that he had a I don't know if this is the right word, but audiographic memory, or whatever he heard, he could remember for years and years on end. And both missionaries make note of that. That sermons that were preached many years earlier could be recited verbatim back to the missionary that preached it by Kwaki. So he's a man that memorized many scriptures, was converted to faith in Christianity, dedicated his life to preaching, had lost his sight before he ever had access to the Hawaiian Bible. So much of his uh, Christian learning was in the old tradition of Hawaiian style, where it was an oral tradition. And as a, as a chapter in the court of Hiboliho, it was very much a discipline that he was uh, adapted to. So he was able to memorize huge sections of scripture and entire sermons. And that was one of his amazing characters. He also was a Lua master. And, uh, he spoke a different dialect of Olelo Hawaii, from the, they called it the Olelo Kake. There's some mixed reviews about what exactly it was when I talked to some way Olelo Hawaii Kumu, but um, the speculation is that the Olelo Kake was a dialect that the Ali'i would use to further separate themselves from the other class of people. So they could talk to each other and nobody would know. And uh, Kuahiki had the ability to speak uh, Olelo Kake and what we call the He's buried at the Alamon Church yeah, in the cemetery right there. And um, sadly, so is Honolili and Hoku, but they are in unmarked graves. So Kahu, Mian, Higa, and uh, the church will try to remedy that exact thing right now. We're hoping to build a, a memorial for our heroes. Um, Queen Leopani was really one of the most amazing believers of, of her time. And pretty well documented um, her Christ like character under you know, imprisonment and, and overthrow. Uh, she did write a book that many of you are familiar with, Holy uh, Story by Holy Speed. This is the original, this is from 1898 when it was published. Um, and all throughout this book, she makes mention of her Christian faith. But most powerfully, for me, if I can read this story, if I can find it. I know what you're thinking, why are you, why are you touching the book? <laughs> I bought it, I can't touch it. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, I don't want my DNA on this book. <laughs> 100 years ago. Uh, hang on. It might take me a second to find this book, and it will probably be worth doing this. Destroy are crying 
allow to him in their time of trouble. And he will keep his promise and will listen to the voices of his Hawaiian children lamenting for their homes. It is for them that I will give the last drop of my blood. It is for them that I will spend, may, and spending everything belonging to me. Will it be in vain? It is for the American people and their representatives in Congress to answer this question. As they deal with me and my people kindly, generously, and justly, so may the great ruler of all nations deal with the grand and glorious nation of the United States of America. So she appeals to the United States of America on their Christian basis. I'm asking you this as Christian brothers and sisters, not as a politician, not as a monarch. As a believer in Jesus Christ, who oversees the kingdom that worships Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to make this right. Um, don't think, I'm not saying that this was prophecy, so don't say, don't tell people I said God did this, all right? But what is haunting irony is that she says, lest you inhabit, uh, inherit uh, punishment of Ahab. Well, as you know, um, the president responsible for the annexation of Wadi was President McKinley, who was shortly thereafter assassinated. Which is haunting irony when you think of the words that were written by the Queen before that happened. So like I said, I'm not saying this prophecy, I'm not saying God killed President McKinley. Okay? I'm just saying this, it's strikingly haunting when you read the words of the Queen and you know the, the history of America. So, um, since we're talking over, so here in, this is a this is printed in 1893 in Hawaii. This is the memoirs of Henry Okakani. So even up until the years of the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, the story of Henry O was still being told and still being used as a platform to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it really it, and it remains. I mean, hundreds of years after its publication, it was a powerful tool in my life. So it, it's still being printed. In 2022, it was printed in 1893, and it was the diary of a young white man all the way back in the early 1800s. Let's see. Um, oh, I can talk a little bit about revival. So, um, one of the products of revival is that people want to go out and now share their their newfound faith in Christ. Um, I have a youth group that is. Uh, by demographic, 100% Micronesian. I have no non-Micronesian members of my youth mission. Uh, what is amazing is that the, the gospel reached Micronesia through the work of Native Hawaiian missionaries, mm -hmm. namely James uh, Kakela, Hezekiah Aita. There was a ship called the Morning Star that was the vessel used to take the gospel to, to uh, Micronesia, to Marshall Islands, and, you know, uh, and, and we do have some original documents from the Morning Star Mission. That's what, that's what this is. And uh, you know the, the captain of the Morning Star, the captain of the original Morning Star, Hiram Bingham, the son, yeah. the guy that discovered Machu Picchu. Did you guys know that? Hiram Bingham, Hiram Bingham's son yeah. was the person that discovered Machu Picchu, isn't it? Yeah. Third, third, sorry, third. Yeah, and the captain of the Morning Star, crazy, right? So the Bingham family, some pretty amazing things throughout the issue. Um, yeah, I could talk all night or uh, <laughs> could ask, ask a question or two or whatever, however you guys want to do it. Yeah, let's please uh, ask Pastor K. I some questions, but didn't you appreciate that? Yeah. yeah. Extraordinary guy. If I had these heart attacks, I wouldn't let you touch them. <laughs> I was going to invite you. So we're going to take a break. Then you want to find your way up here and uh, take a look at some of these things. I know several were passed around. But what a great, great session. Yeah. Again, yeah. let's, let's yes. show our appreciation. Yes. Uh, and I enjoyed every word you said. I love it. So, uh, don't use the weapons against anybody. <laughs> uh, come on up, do this. We'll resume in uh, 12 minutes. We'll What's that? We're going to practice that. Yeah. <laughs>